the founder and, and president of CompuDot, um, and CompuDot is, is very pleased to have everybody here for, for this, what will be, I guarantee you, a very, very interesting talk. Uh, just a couple words on CompuDot and why we do this. Uh, CompuDot was founded in uh, 2007, I believe, uh, to help bridge the digital divide with our underserved children. CompuDot provides computers and computer general technology education free of charge uh, to children in the greater Houston area. And to date, we have provided almost 9,000 free computers to children in the Houston area and tens of thousands of hours of free technology education. Uh, and it has truly been a community effort, so I thank everybody who's been involved in that. And one of the fun things we get to do is this breakfast. Um, and this breakfast is really not about CompuDoc. Uh, it's just brought to you by CompuDoc. Because uh, as we're trying to get these kids interested in technology and excited about the possible career paths they may have, what better way than to celebrate some of the really amazing technology that we have being developed right here in Houston. And we're fortunate to live in Houston because there's quite a bit of choice. Uh, there's amazing stuff going on in Houston. Uh, in all areas of technology. And so in this quasi-quarterly breakfast, Technology for Tomorrow, we try to choose the, the, some of the very best um, and in different areas of technology. And we are uh, very, very happy to have this morning the best of the best. And I, it, will be, it will be very, very interesting. So to introduce our speaker, I would like to introduce my old friend, uh, Ed Fine. Um, and old in the sense that he has been my friend for a long time. <laughs> but I will point out, um, Ed is the Chief Intellectual Property Counsel of NASA. Um, and he has been working at NASA for 49 years and how many months? Who's counting? Who's counting? Almost 50 years. Uh, and we were talking earlier about how long we've known each other. Maybe 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, nicest guy you will ever meet. So. Please. Well, thanks. Thanks for that kind of introduction. And all of all of it's true. Uh, I'm old. Um, <laughs> talking about technology, um, we, we the uh, International Space Station achieved a milestone: uh, 100,000 orbits just recently. So. Uh, there's some pretty amazing technology there. Um, when, when John asked me to do this, I, I, you know, it, it's almost impossible to uh, introduce Franklin Chang Diaz and keep it short. We could be here through dinner. Uh, so I, I want you all to promise me when you get back to your offices, just Google Franklin Chang Diaz because his story is is awesome. It's amazing. He, uh, he is certainly uh, an American hero, uh, a Costa Rican hero, and, and one of my heroes, without doubt. So please do Google it, because I'm going to be really brief. Um, Franklin, as you will soon find out, is chairman and CEO of Ad Astra Rocket Company. Uh, a U.S. firm developing uh, advanced plasma rocket technology and applications in sustainable energy uh, with operations both here, well actually in Webster down in the Clear Lake area, and in Costa Rica. Um, he founded Ad Astra in 2005, I can't believe it's been that long, time flies, uh, after a 25 year career uh, as a NASA astronaut. He, uh, he flew seven space missions, which is uh, a record uh, that he shares with uh, a colleague of his, Jerry Ross. Um, okay, so Franklin, uh, as you might suspect from his name, uh, is of Chinese and Costa Rican Hispanic descent. Uh, probably the only Chinese, Hispanic, Costa Rican astronaut uh, we've ever had. Um, he was born in Costa Rica. Can I give the age of the year? 1950. Um, one of six children. As, as a kid growing up in Costa Rica, uh, he, uh, he would gather his friends 
and put a bunch of chairs in a box in his backyard and, uh, and pretend it was a rocket ship. This man is driven. He was determined to be an astronaut when he was a little kid. And let me tell you something, when Franklin Chain is, it determines to do something, you just need to get out of his way. I can tell you that. Um, so uh, anyhow, after graduating high school in Costa Rica, he worked for a year and saved some money so that he could come to, uh, to the United States and achieve his dream. Uh, so in 1968, with $50 in his pocket, he was 18 years old. $50 in his pocket and a one-way airplane ticket, he came to this country. Uh, he moved to Hartford, Connecticut uh, with his uncle and enrolled again in high school, mainly to, uh, to learn in English. He, he did not speak English when he got here. Uh, and to trans transition to the uh, U.S. education system. I'm leaving out a whole lot of really in interesting stuff here because it was a struggle. Uh, but he did go on to uh, earn an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from UConn and uh, ultimately a PhD in plasma physics from MIT. So uh, we have with us a, a real rocket scientist. Um, Franklin was selected as an astronaut in 1980. In uh, 94, in, uh, in conjunction with his astronaut duties, he founded and directed the Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory at the uh, Johnson Space Center. Uh, if any of you all have been out there, his lab was out in the, um, in the uh, big water tank, uh, the, the, uh, the zero gravity simulator, um, which is what, several miles north of the center. Uh, and he built this rocket in that facility. And when he fired it up, uh, I think all of the lights in Southeast Houston dimmed. Um, it, it was pretty amazing. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, this is the, uh, the variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket, Vasimir, um, that he invented and built uh, and NASA did patent it. Uh, when NASA decided to underfund it, uh, Franklin decided that, you know, like I said, if he's in, intent on doing something, he's going to do it. Uh, he reluctantly retired and started this company to carry on his technology. We licensed the patent to him. Um, and uh, when he was with at NASA building his rocket, I, I remember that uh, he acquired parts for this rocket uh, from university dumpsters uh, and who knows where he begged, borrowed, and hopefully didn't steal, but, but he did build the rocket on, 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 the, on the cheap, right? Um, and by means I suspect were probably outside of the uh, regulations, the federal acquisition regulations. Um, I don't know. Don't ask, don't tell. But he did. He built it. So uh, we, did, we did license those patents to add Astra uh, on retirement. And he's, uh, uh, the rocket, as you will soon hear, is currently under development uh, with some... I'm not going to steal this thunder because it is incredible technology. Um, He's, I, to, to go to list his recognition and awards it is, would take all day. Uh, but he, uh, he is, uh, was awarded the, by President Reagan uh, the Liberty Medal at the uh, Statue of Liberty, Liberty Centennial. Uh, he's uh, um, a member of the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Uh, he's an adjunct professor, professor at Rice in U of H. Um, I think I'm going to stop here, but uh, I am very proud to consider Franklin a NASA colleague, a NASA client, and more importantly, a, a close friend. So please, please welcome Franklin Chang.
you so much, and John, thank you, and all of you, thank you so much for inviting me to visit with you in this, this breakfast morning and foggy day in Houston. The, um, the rocket that, uh, that Ed was, um, was talking about is this one here, and um, this is the latest uh, embodiment of it, the latest version. We call it the VX200. Uh, there it is. It's Compared to Jared, is a, he, Jared is about six six feet uh, tall, and uh, this rocket uh, uh, has been under development for many years uh, and uh, has now completed um, a total of about 10,000 10, uh, high power uh, firing. Uh, we've had no failures so far. Uh, very reliable, uh, very repeatable performance. And now this is, a, this is a type of rocket that's unlike um, the conventional rockets that we are used to, to seeing on the, on the TV or the launch pads. Uh, this rocket doesn't really take off from the Earth. It, this is a rocket that works only in space. It's a plasma, it's a plasma engine. And it is not used to launch things into space. It's only used to move things that are already there. So, the first step to getting stuff um, into space will remain um, the, 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 the means of getting there will remain uh, the chemical rocket that we know uh, that we know so well. But it is the um, the upper stage, the next step uh, to getting things moving from low Earth orbit to points beyond. That's where the business uh, uh, interest is. That's, that's where the uh, the advantage. The advantage lies. So, so um, here's the commercial, um, the commercial um, motivation. We want to be able to increase and specifically double, <coughs> double the commercial revenue by increasing the upper stage payload uh, capability. This is this is what a conventional rocket can do today. Um, Usually the first stage is just a very heavy, uh, big uh, chemical booster that launches things into LEO and low Earth, low Earth orbit. And that doesn't change. But the second stage um, still is a chemical stage. Uh, and what actually is useful payload is actually very small. If you remember the, um, um, uh, the Saturn V rocket, went to the moon, you know, a gigantic rocket, and what actually got to the moon was a little tiny, tiny thing. And we want to change that. We want to increase the green, the green, the payload, <coughs> the payload, uh, we want to increase that by reducing the size of the, uh, the, stage, the second stage and increasing its performance. And that's what plasma propulsion, electric propulsion can do for it. Um, and so this is the actual result. So that's the, um, the um, financial motivation for, uh, for doing this sort of thing. Let's go to the next one. This, this gives you a, a scale for all the pieces that form the, uh, that, uh, form the Apollo moon uh, rocket, uh, out of which only this actually got to the moon, and this actually got to Earth. Uh, this is what actually returned. So most of the stuff that you see on the launch pad is essentially uh, rocket fuel. This is the problem. So, okay, let's get into a little bit on the, the, the physics and the engineering of this, of this, of this contraption. Okay, basically, uh, let's go first here, and let's not uh, click the movie yet, but uh, uh, look at this particular um, uh, schematic here. This is a like an x-ray of what the, the physics of the device uh, actually um, looks like. What this is, is a, essentially a magnetic, uh, magnetic pipe. And, and the reason we want we to use magnetic fields is because we want to um, uh, generate a very hot uh, plasma. Uh, a plasma is essentially a, a charged particle gas, a gas of 
of ionized material is what the sun is made out of, what the stars are made out of, it's very, very hot. Anything that you heat to temperatures of uh, 10,000 degrees and up and above um, actually becomes a charged uh, a fluid, a, a soup of charged particles, both positive and negative. And um, we call that a plasma, and we want to get um, the plasma very hot because the hotter the, the plasma, the hotter the exhaust of this rocket, the more um, efficient it will be, the more fuel efficient it will be, the less propellant <coughs> you will need because everything that goes out the back of the rocket uh, has more speed. So the higher the speed of the exhaust, the less exhaust that you have to use. Um, so we want to we wanna get um, a plasma that's very, very hot inside a pipe, in a pipe that has an, uh, essentially a nozzle. But that pipe has to be uh, able to withstand the, uh, the temperature. And this is the limitation in chemical rockets, is how hot you can make this, uh, the exhaust. But if the pipe is made out of magnetic, uh, a magnetic field, then it will not melt. And um, it turns out that this uh, magnetic pipe can be built with technology that we have today. Uh, it needs a very strong magnetic field, but the magnetic field is produced by <coughs> windings, uh, a solenoidal type uh, arrangement of windings. And these things, uh, back in the early days, used to be you know, very heavy copper coils that required a lot of electricity. This is why, why Ed Fine was saying that, um, that it will dim the lights. And it was actually kind of true. <laughs> it required a huge amount of electricity to drive, not really the rocket, but really to drive the magnetic uh, um, uh, coils, magnetic windings that, uh, that would produce the, the magnetic pipe. Well, not anymore. Now we use uh, superconducting uh, magnets, uh, superconducting uh, tapes um, that can carry lots of current with no resistance. And these things are very lightweight. So the technology has come of age for us to be able to make these kinds of magnetic pipes. And so we actually have one uh, magnetic uh, um, uh, envelope uh, like this operating in the in the laboratory now for it's been there since 2009 operating very well so once you have this magnetic uh, pipe then you put the plasma and the plasma actually is produced at the front end of the rocket from just conventional gas in our case is, is we use argon but we could use um, we could use uh, hydrogen we could use um, krypton uh, xenon uh, neon, um, we could use uh, even mixtures of um, uh, hydrogen and say hydrogen and uh, nitrogen and that uh, chemically is like ammonia, you know, you could uh, actually store a lot of fuel in a chemical form, the form of ammonia um, as uh, hydrogen with uh, nitrogen together and then you, you, you have a, a different types of fuels will give you different performance and it's like having a rocket which has multiple gears. And it turns out that that's what you need when you are moving in, in space. Uh, you need gears. You need sometimes a lot more muscle and sometimes a lot more speed in the exhaust because you're going in hills. You're climbing a gravitational hill when you're coming out of the Earth, gravitational uh, force. You need a lot of muscle. But when you are in free space, you can actually uh, essentially upshift and increase the uh, velocity of the exhaust and be more uh, capable of going faster and faster. So these types of rockets give you a tremendous performance, enable you to um, move a lot of payload, but also it, in the long run, they go faster than a conventional chemical rocket. So, so we make plasma here uh, with uh, we make it with uh, electromagnetic waves, so we have an antenna here and another antenna right here, and the electromagnetic waves, just like a microwave oven, just get that plasma really hot, and, um, and, and the plasma here is added, uh, is, in, 
its temperature increases up to about uh, 2.5 million degrees. This is uh, essentially what now uh, happens in the laboratory. We uh, routinely operate these kinds of plasmas, but two, two, two and a half to three million degrees, about the size, the temperature of the sun. Yeah. And uh, this is the package. So this is the physics. This is the engineering. You know, how do you put this together? You have to put it in, a, of course, in a thermos bottle uh, because the, the superconducting magnet, which is here, it has to be in a a cryostat and something that keeps it very cold. The windings of that uh, magnet are operating at around 5 to 4 or 5 Kelvin, so uh, very close to absolute zero. Um, yet, the superconducting magnet we have has no fluids. It has, uh, you would think that it would be swimming in liquid helium, but it doesn't. It, it, it is all controlled by, by very careful engineering, a careful conduction, uh, cooled and uh, and so we have a cryogen free uh, superconducting enclosure here which makes this very lightweight and of course the inside uh, what we call here the rocket core kind of the, the, the core of an apple you know the, the stuff that you put inside the bore of this magnet is essentially two stages from the, the first stage is the ionizer <coughs> the ionizer which is called a helicon and the second stage is an ion cyclotron resonance heater. They, they follow the same rough principle of using electromagnetic uh, waves to, uh, to energize this plasma. You don't want to touch the plasma with anything <laughs> made out of metal or any material because it will vaporize it. But you can, you can heat it, control it with fields and waves. And so out goes uh, an exhaust. And this is an actual photograph. And now, uh, John, maybe you can click the um, this movie right here. If you can click on that, you can see a real shot. This is a real firing of the rocket. This is the exhaust coming out. You can see the magnetic, the magnetic nozzle. There is no physical nozzle. And people are always wondering, where is the nozzle? Well, it's, it's, it's invisible. And uh, this is not uh, a photograph, it's actually a movie. This is what it looks like. We have some uh, diagnostics in there, and these diagnostics, of course, don't last very long. <laughs> They're made out of uh, very sophisticated uh, ceramics, very tough materials, and they, they, they just stay there for a little while, and then they, they vaporize, and you have to build them again. So. Um, but we, we can get them in there long enough to, um, to, to make the measurements. So this is what the, the plasma rocket uh, looks like today. So let's go to the next, uh, next slide. Now, if you were to um, look at a plot of thrust versus uh, power, electricity, electrical power, we, um, we inhabit in the high power, sort of what we call the high power regime, the, the high power niche. Uh, of uh, plasma engines. There are other engines, there are other plasma rockets that are being developed. Uh, this is not the only one. It is uh, NASA is developing uh, ion engines, hull thrusters, and these are very small, very low power, um, and they are here, and they are very good. These are very good rockets, but they're good for satellite, for just maneuvering satellites, little station keeping, small, small jobs. Uh, this one is more like a, it's kind of like a diesel engine, you know, it's good for trucking, and this is what we want. We, we want to get into the logistics business of moving stuff, large pieces, large uh, objects in space with plasma propulsion, with electric propulsion. So we've done a lot of work on this uh, engine, we've measured its performance. And this is a, a chart of the efficiency of the rocket versus what we call the specific impulse. The specific impulse really is just the exhaust velocity. That's all it is. It's, it's, if you take the exhaust velocity in you know, meters per second and you divide by 10, and the reason they divide by 10 is because 10 is the acceleration of gravity you know, on the surface of the Earth. This is what the rocket scientists way back in the Von Braun yeah, days uh, they, they found it very convenient to divide by the acceleration of gravity. It's a, it's a constant, and it was just about 10. So you take the, uh, 
exhaust velocity, you divide by 10, you get the specific impulse. So the specific impulse has, a, has the units of seconds. Um, so it's, you know, velocity, meters per second divided by, by the meters per second squared, you get seconds. And um, you want uh, as much of the electricity that you put in um, to become thrust or to become um, useful um, momentum out the back. And that's called the efficiency. The, the, the number of, um, uh, uh, that we are interested in is, is essentially a fraction. Is, is, uh, <coughs> and we're looking at, at numbers of the order of about 70%. Uh, which is very good. If you, you, that means 70% of the electrical power that you put into this rocket goes out the, out the business end to give you propulsion. So it's very good. So let me give you a comparison. Um, we, uh, we talk about these rockets in terms of, of power, in ter terms of kilowatts. And there's a lot of folks that uh, you know, are often struggle with, you know, how much is a kilowatt? A kilowatt, like when you blow your hair in a hotel, in a hair dryer, it's about a kilowatt. <laughs> and that's just to get you an idea. Most of the work that NASA has been doing on electric propulsion is on that scale. This is the NSTAR uh, ion engine. These are ion thrusters. And the uh, next, uh, this is a more advanced uh, ion engine. These are, these are very low power devices. The hull thruster, which is another option, another version of the, uh, of the ion engine uh, NASA has been working on, uh, is getting up to about 12 kilowatts. So just to give you a sense of what can you do with, you know, uh, 2 to 10 kilowatts, this is what you get, you know. So the little scooter is about uh, 2 kilowatts, about the golf cart is about 8 kilowatts. Um, well, we can't really go to Mars with <laughs> scooters, <laughs> golf carts. Uh, you know, you could maybe if you send a little robot, um, you could do it. In fact, we have done uh, deep space missions um, with very low power uh, ion engines, but the payload that you, that you deliver there is very small. Humans cannot really be miniaturized. <laughs> so we are going to have to be uh, carrying our weight uh, to Mars if you uh, send humans you know, alive. So, um, <laughs> so that's, uh, that means you have to get into the bigger, bigger rockets. And this is, this is uh, what we have today. The 200 kilowatt uh, VX200 compares to the Tesla more or less, um, 200 kilowatts. And then a, a moon um, deep space uh, vehicle, uh, robotic for like a tug, would be about uh, two megawatts, about two, 2,000 kilowatts, would be about like a tugboat, like a tugboat uh, on, 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 uh, uh, in the, you know, the Gulf Coast. And then um, this is what we would envision to go to Mars at 747, has about uh, 200 megawatts. This is about the power of the four uh, engines uh, that a 747 has. And, and this is what we are proposing. Uh, this uh, ship is big. It's, about the, it's, it's bigger than the space station. So you wouldn't be able to launch it from the, from the surface of the Earth. You'd have to assemble it uh, far away, probably near the moon, in the vicinity of the moon. Um, probably not on the moon itself, but in the vicinity of it. And it would be uh, nuclear power. And this is an important issue that we have to wrestle with because a lot of people are afraid. Uh, but we're not going to get very far. Humans, we're, we're not going to get very far in deep space without nuclear power. And I'm talking about nuclear electric, not nuclear, not, not the nuclear rocket that we used to have in the, in the 1960s, the, the, the NERVA program, which was a nuclear thermal rocket. Uh, we, we're talking about a nuclear electric.